We are Myth Vision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Lambert. Ladies and gentlemen, Joseph Atwell is joining us again on Myth Vision Podcast. It's been some time. If you haven't checked our previous interviews out, please do. Me and Dr. Luther were hanging out with Joe Atwell before. We were talking about his book, Caesar's Messiah. We still haven't done Shakespeare's Messiah. We need to actually talk about that someday. Right now, though, we're going to be talking about your thesis. And a lot of people are probably new to subscribing to this channel, Joe. And they've never actually maybe read your book, heard about your book. And so one of the processes that I take, right, is to be cautious and skeptical and consider data. Collect as much data as possible before trying to draw a conclusion or trying to be anything dogmatic. I've been dogmatic my whole life as a Christian. I think it's time that I slow down when we have such scant evidence to really draw serious conclusions on so many things. And I think the Socratic method is an extremely healthy and a reasonable approach when you're dealing with texts that aren't just history let me let me add the value you said before i hit record cultic history we're talking highly theological strange mythological motifs and and uh allegorical approaches things that are just like how do you interpret things like this and how can you be dogmatic about so much when we know so little and so joe thank you for joining me again today it's my pleasure um gee the uh your your show has gained uh, so much uh, popularity. It's wonderful to see. And it's just such a breath of fresh air for New Testament scholarship to have, um, you know, it, it just a show where so many different ideas can come forward. Uh, it's just wonderful. Yeah, good for you. Well, thank you, Joe. And I think it's important that we keep the ideas coming and it doesn't need to just be from the academic world. I myself am not an academic. I don't have a PhD. Maybe one day I'll drive home something if that's something I have the appeal to do. But I like the flexibility. I like to hone in on ideas and broaden my scope and delve into various topics without some political, and I don't mean like Democrat or Republican, I mean in the academic world, a political uh, agenda driving me to say you can't explore beyond the scope of the consensus on these ideas. So this is one of the things I admire and do, even though I honor and respect academia. I myself don't necessarily draw it just because consensus does. It's something worth looking at and knowing what they think and why, but also challenging ideas. And you do that all too well. You've bucked uh, a lot of people. How do I put this? You've gotten uh, under a lot of people's skin in the past with this book right here, Caesar's Messiah. This is a hot book. And if you haven't read it, I don't care if you disagree with every jot and tittle in this book at the end of the day. This book right here, if you read this book, it is fascinating. He does this uh, typology connecting, you know, we know mimesis. We call it mimesis in the scholarly of the world. It's a typology off of Moses and the Exodus that we see in Matthew. It's almost verbatim, narrative-wise, structural-wise, etc., is the New Testament Gospels and potentially more within the New Testament doing the same thing except with Josephus's writings? Well, read this book and you'll be shocked to see Vespasian and Titus's life and often possible parallels between them. A, a woman named Mary with a child who is a burnt sacrifice, burnt offering in the temple's destruction. We know that the Gospels are temple centric and focusing on that. Got to read the book. I don't want to give too much away. I'll let Joe do that. But absolutely get the book. He also has the uh, Shakespeare's Messiah. Where is that thing at? Uh, anyway, you can look it up on Amazon. It's in the description down below. Joe, sorry for the intro, long gated, but let's discuss your thesis. And I'm sorry if you hear background no noise. No. Um, well, I mean, my thesis is that the Gospels were created by the Flavians, um, and they structured the sequence of events in Jesus's life and the events as well to be a broad structured typology so that uh, the Son of Man that Jesus is predicting is identified by the stories in the Gospels, and it would indicate that the Son of Man is the Roman uh, Flavian Caesar, who who uh, came and uh, destroyed uh, the rebellious Messianic movement in the first century. Um, the the reason why the book is so popular, I suppose, is because it has a really strong argument, and the argument is based on the idea that there's been something really overlooked 
um, in New Testament scholarship. Uh, you talk about new ideas and the need for new ideas in all fields, but particularly in ones that are attached to theology, it's a good idea. And the thing that was overlooked was sequence. Um, there was, I think until Caesar's Messiah, there really was never a work of Christian scholarship that ascribed a events in Jesus's ministry. Um, and this is an oversight. It's an analytic blunder because if you look at the very first page of the Gospels, the New Testament in, the, in Matthew, he has a long series of typologic links between Jesus and Moses, and they occur in sequence. In fact, without the sequence, some of the um, parallels are so obtuse that they couldn't be recognized. But because they are all occurring in sequence, the overall construction is, uh, is, is visible and the individual aspects that make it up are visible. So sequence is extremely important um, in the typology of the New Testament. Um, and there are many events, uh, people will agree, of course, that uh, are from the Roman Jewish war that pop up in uh, the gospels. You know, you have uh, the encircling of Jerusalem, the raising of the temple, the abomination of desolation. You know, there, there are things which um, are historical events which have, you know, popped up in the gospels. Now, they occur in the same sequence in the Gospels as um, the uh, events occurred in uh, the war that uh, Josephus recorded. Um, and so this would just in and of itself um, create a strong uh, premise that um, it wasn't just these individual events that, that ended up in the Gospels, but that the whole storyline. Because if you look at the geographical journey Jesus takes, um, it's parallel to the uh, one, the, the Flavian military campaign. Starts in Galilee, Sea of Galilee, you have an event which can be seen as fishing for men. And you go on to uh, Jerusalem, you spend a little bit of time outside Jerusalem, you have a triumphant entrance. You know, you go inside, the temple gets raised. And then you have, um, this, uh, what I, I regard as just like the gold standard of typologic connection is the three crucified, one survives uh, passage, which, you know, I presented in Caesar's Messiah and now is just uh, almost becoming mainstream New Testament scholarship. There's so many people commenting on this that it it is seen as uh, in the same light, you know, say encircling Jerusalem with the wall or the raising of the temple. It was just as a lot of New Testament scholars who, who agree that it is that the two events are related because they're so similar, they just say this was a piece of history that somehow found its way into the Gospels. They don't, um, uh, you know, attempt to contest the idea that um, the two events are not somehow related. So, but however, once you have placed that position inside the events of the Gospels as uh, coming from uh, you know, the Jewish war that Josephus wrote about, well, now you're almost <laughs> completely to, to my, my thesis because um, at that point, you only need to just put in place the, the absolutely no-brainer parallels that other scholars have written about, you know, binding and loosening. I mean, Eisman writes about uh, the conclusion of the Gospels where Simon is condemned and uh, taken to Rome, how similar this is, uh, you know, the, the Josephus event is to the one in the Gospels. And then, you know, and, and th so there's so there's all these these uh, parallels that have been seen by scholars. Well, once you just sort of lay the historical events next to the ones where uh, they're either just no brainer, they're just so parallel that they can't be disputed, or they've been, you know, talked about by other uh New Testament scholars in isolation. Well, you're already my my thesis is simply, you know, QED. There it is. The at this and this, of course, Derek has a meaning in that when Jesus predicts the Son of Man, it it certainly would indicate that this is the um, Flavian Caesar. And of course, this is completely unified theologically and logically with Josephus's Wars of the Jews because he identifies the Flavian Caesar as the uh, Messiah that the Jewish prophecies foresaw, 
And he even describes the new covenant um, in that he, he has a divine experience with God, a dream, and he understands that all of God's favor now goes over to the Romans. Uh, so it's, it, 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 is, um, uh, it is odd that sequence hasn't really been uh, analyzed, you know, the sequence of events um, in, in, the, uh, in the Gospels haven't really been just wondered about as to where the exact sequence came from, because so many scholars are mythical or was embellished, which would mean that, that the uh, actual sequence events is not historical. So where does it come from? And uh, given that, um, you know, like the geographical parallels are, are straightforward, anyone can see this. And then if you look back to the, um, what I really call the template for the, the typology, which is a, which is a typology that begins the gospels, the one in Matthew where you have, you know, the um, Joseph has dreams, he goes from Israel to Egypt. Um, you know, you have uh, the, the, the uh, slaughter of the innocents, you know, the massacre of the innocents. I mean, and I won't go into it, but there's like eight events which are understood by scholarship. Um, Goulder brought out this information, you know, 60, 70 years ago. And so uh, you, that system of typology is made up of names um, and locations, concepts, and sequence. Uh, this is the same type, this is the exact same system that goes forward in time uh, to, uh, to Titus. Um, so it's the, the thing about, and the thing about Caesar Messiah is that uh, you know, I get to, if I choose, I can debate, you know, anyone I want, basically, because a lot of people want, want to do it. But it's really uh, not particularly interesting for me. I mean, I've done, I mean, you've, if you've ever listened to, I did a really long one with uh, Dr. Price years ago, which I thought was a good one. I've had exchanges, you know, um, with Carrier that have been, ex, you know, extensive. And then I've done a lot of, like, uh, debating with Christian apologists. But it's really not particularly interesting in the sense that, um, the quality of evidence is static. In other words, I just have the sequence. I have the events. Um, people can make it whatever they want out of it, but they can't really get rid of the of the the sequence events in the New Testament, the sequence of the events in Josephus, and the um, the, the what I would say to people who are contesting it is: Look, you can basically verify the idea that there was a broad typologic connection between Josephus uh, and the Gospels without any of the exotic parallels that I show. You can just use the locations, the, the things which are exactly the same historical events, like encircling Jerusalem with a wall, for example, and then the, the parallels that have already been discussed by other scholars. And then you, you would have a, a long sequence and, and um, of... Uh, you know, a very unusual and unique events, which couldn't be circumstantial. And, and now at this point, you have a new kind of New Testament scholarship, but you have a new idea about how to look at the Gospels, is, is to try to look at them as typologic literature uh, generated by um, the Roman imperial court. It, it is interesting, Doc, and if you hear any background noise, please, I think my neighbor's mowing his grass. Um, Dr. Price, actually, the other day, we were talking about an article he wrote that's going to come out in the Journal of Higher Criticism on, like, did Jesus exist? Which one of the things you do that I think are interesting in your book is you don't really say um, there was or there wasn't a guy. Uh, and it, it's not necessary for what you're trying to prove or what you're trying to show. Um, he's pointing out in this article that where Christians are waiting on a second coming of Jesus, uh, mythicists just say the first one never happened. And so there's this problem of like, you guys are talking about a second, but where's the first? And <laughs> in this article, though, he's talking about how we would want to know, you know, what we could use to base on the historical Jesus. Uh, and, and while that was going on, I'm in my head going, hold on. It does sound like there's a fulfillment, even though it's not, literally a fulfillment it's ex eventu of the temple's destruction i gave dr bob a call and we were on the phone and wouldn't you know it he goes i i think that the uh i think that the, the prophecy of the son of man being third person coming from the lips of jesus he wasn't saying he himself necessarily was 
the Son of Man, but that the Son of Man was going to come. He goes, and I think that that fits the Vespasian Titus uh, parallel in the Gospels. So going from the debate that he was in with you, where he was like, parallelomania, you know, this is years ago, like yeah. years and years ago. And if you haven't caught that debate, it's like deeply buried somewhere on the internet. And uh, But it was a really interesting debate. You guys were not seeing eye to eye on many things. And now he's like, you know, actually, I think there's something to this. One of my biggest hesitations, if I can get that out up front, is that it's dark, uh, that, that it has a dark intention, right? I don't want to say that that isn't the case in, in the New Testament, that there are clear indications of anti-Semitism and things like that, especially, I mean, even the consensus looks at John and says, yeah, John is like blaming all Jewish people. No wonder second century Christians were literally anti-Semites. It's like obvious. It's right in front of your eyes and you just got to be blind if you're not looking. But the totality of everything is the difficult part for me is saying everything's like a dark comedy, so to speak. Would your thesis work the same even if it wasn't dark comedy in your eyes? I mean, suppose they were really trying to convince people of a new type of uh, religion and uh, well, you know, it, it could in the sense that um, Rome had been trying to get a religious control over uh, Judaism for generations. I mean, uh, um, if you uh, go back to how they manipulated uh, the Herods, you know, inserted the Herods and then um, the Herods took uh, Hasmonean brides, you know, they were trying to breed a Christ, basically, you know, one that they could raise in Rome and, um, you know, have as a, a Roman uh, leader of, of the religion. Um, the Herods took over the Sanhedrin, you know, they were doing the interpretation of law. Um, but I would say that the sad thing is here is that the Roman Jewish struggle was such a bloodbath. It was so fundamental to uh, the history of the era that there's really no way to separate it from the religion. It's impossible. Um, you know, you, you look at going forward, you know, uh, the Barcocas, uh, Barcoca rebellion and the Kiddos rebellion. I mean, these things were empire wide bloodbaths. They're sort of buried in history. Um, there are, there are, details which give us an understanding of just how catastrophic this was. I mean, the Kiddos Rebellion, which is in 115, very few people even know about. But in it, um, the Jews gained control over the island of Cyprus, I believe, and they, they genocided all 200,000 Gentiles. The regions in, uh, in Egypt that they took over were depopulated. You know, there's an actual letter that was uncovered of a Roman magistrate fleeing down the Egypt, heading toward, uh, uh, you know, southern Africa to get out of the regions that the, the Jews had, had conquered. So this wasn't a trivial rebellion. I mean, this was existential life and death. And so the religion, which, you know, I mean, just to, to, to give an example, you take the central concept of Christianity, which is the human Passover lamb. I mean, this is a a specific denigration of Judaism in that it is relating to and is talking about a new covenant that has as part of its foundation, um, you know, this Mary character in Josephus who actually eats her son. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid that, you know, the idea that that Christianity can be partitioned away from the dark Roman humor and just leave the positive um, sort of homilies that Jesus pronounces. I don't think this is really possible. And I, I think that it's actually, in a, in a strange way, it's actually useful for humans to understand that, um, you know, the, the oligarchs, the people who create history, because what we have history is their understanding of what we of how, how how to make us easy to control um you know uh we have to be more skeptical of it you know we talk about the socratic method which you know i would say it would be you know just a good standard for certainly new testament scholarship but moreover for all citizens to have in relationship to uh 
the government to uh, the the history that's being given us to the the news we're given. I mean, the Socratic method is is really what has been developed um, uh, to defend us uh, against uh, being fooled and and also to to strengthen um, the bonds between humans uh, through reason. You know, if we use this approach, we don't have to end up in a you know in a uh, in a in a binary situation, a zero sum game where. I'm here in, in this process of negotiation to defeat you and to have a victory right. over or, you. Or to, and, be, or to be right. Uh, even or to have to be right, right. So yeah. but rather it's a process of understanding that is really what we need to give ourselves to. And the, the more that, that this approach is taken, um, just the better quality of citizens we have. And, and I think that in the New Testament scholarship, um, it has been completely lost. We were talking before the show started about, you know, why this is the case. Why, why that there's so much um, vitriol in the exchanges. Um, and there's lots of reasons for it. But I think the, the primary one is just that there isn't uh, the standard of uh, the Socratic method as being the process that should be followed. You know, they talk about peer review. Well, that's interesting. Um, it gives a kind of power to groups of academics, but it hasn't really produced great scholarship, certainly not in the New Testament zone, and it doesn't produce a process by which the, the public can enter into. You know, it, it's so top down, it's so authoritative. It's really, um, I, I just feel it's that, that one of the reasons why I'm just so delighted with the success of, of your show is that really, if you just stand back and, and you know, but like what is Myth Vision doing? Myth Vision is restoring the Socratic method to New Testament scholarship. And and I want to spread yeah. the ideas for everybody. Yeah. A mom, a dad, someone, a single mom at home who has the the inquisitive mind to be yeah. able to listen and, and while taking care of her kids at home can listen to something like this. She can't go to a college classroom. She can't enter into an academic school. I want the lay person to hear ideas and to be able to go, okay. So one of the things getting into an example, um, Dr. Price talks about suffering servant ideas. I could see, and, and this is using a Socratic method. I want to throw this out there to you. Yeah. You can agree. Um, you're, you might think your position makes better sense for all the reasons of your study and everything, but there's the idea of the suffering servant as like, this is a motif. It's almost a good thing uh, where you and me would look at it and go, this is not a good philosophy to live by. It's almost like um, every time Israel was conquered in the Hebrew Bible, like every nation had them under control and they're just suffering. They're always getting beat up. They're this small little vassal state. They're nothing, you know, compared to the empire's, of the world and they're constantly beat up uh, and the suffering servant prophecies are, are initially talking about Israel or possibly an older Messiah sometime in the old Testament, depending on the context like Isaiah 53 or whatever Christians just, or the new Testament authors just reuse a lot of this typology. Um, the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is there's multiple ways of interpreting the data that I find in the new Testament. Yours is one of them. I'm not saying yours is less than or that theirs is less than or theirs is better and yours is better. It doesn't matter. The point I'm saying is people need to consider these ideas. And if the suffering servant idea is a motif where you and me would look at it and go, that seems kind of dark, like glory in your suffering. Uh, this is a good thing. That looks kind of bad. That can seem sinister and dark as though it's like a dark humor or it can look like these. this cult is developing out of this idea that uh, me being a martyr, me, me suffering is actually a good thing. And God is going to glorify in that kind of mentality. Either way, in my mind, that's still bad. I don't see that as a good thing to live by personally. I do think self-sacrifice is good, especially for loved ones or good friends or to lay your life down to help people. Those are great, um, lessons, right? But the overall picture or like the woman um, eating her child, right? And Josephus, this is a very yeah. interesting parallel. There's so many interesting things, a myth for the world. You point this out and it's like, yeah. what does that sound like Jesus? It sounds like Jesus to me. Yeah. There is this interesting notion though, in the Dionysian cult 
and also in Osiris where they would ingest the god. So the reason I asked if it if there was a way that it wasn't just a joke is that there's this weird cult developing out of this suffering situation where they're actually digesting in their own little cultic practice the god, the, the figure here. Now you would look and say, look, these people suffered. They cannibalized their own kids. And in Deuteronomy, there is this prophecy that in the end of times, when Israel ends up uh, you know, in this bad state, they're going to eat the womb. They're going to eat the children, of the flesh of their own womb and things like that. Horrific prophecies, but either way, I'm not trying to say they actually are true as if they really prophesied this, but every time something like this happens, cannibalism comes on the scene. Here you have this scene in Josephus, but you also have these uh, mystery cults ingesting the divinity to partake in the divine. Do you see that as compatible with what you're suggesting in your thesis? Sure. Um, the the and out of that comes, you know, how you they broke out. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, the Romans had a thought world. You know, they had a, a theological understanding and, and history of different religions. They had mystery cults, obviously, that had eating of the gods as part of their, uh, you know, theology. So I think it's when they went to construct the Gospels, um, they just put together these elements. I mean, to me, it's it 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 actually would explain why these elements are inside the gospels better than than uh i mean the, you can see where they come from they come from the roman thought world the roman theological thought world uh and they combine it with um their understanding of uh the torah um but a particular way of bending the torah i mean what the gospels really are is mm -hmm. is they're trying to take the prophecies and theological principles of Judaism, which produced the warrior Messiah, and and move them in such a way, interpret them in such a way, so that um, they can uh, exist within the Roman Empire without rebellion. And so, I think that's part of what um, the the technique was: is to bring in a broader understanding of. Um, of uh, you know of the, of the relationship between God and the individual, one that that for example, like Stoicism, where you have Stoic ideas inside the Gospels. Now, this was a very convenient philosophy uh, for the oligarchs of Rome in that they could then tell their slaves that the real task you have ahead of you is to learn how to accept your plight, because if you do that, you'll you'll achieve the greatest happiness. Interesting. And I think that's kind of, of um, that, which is which was actually religion or that is actually what um, they're trying to do here. They're trying to just uh, move the um, the fundamentalism and very literal interpretation of the Torah into one that's broader. Um, and I mean, this is you have to kind of really stand back from the Gospels to see this clearly. But. You know, they have uh, Jesus's pro-Roman character, and then he relives so many of the, uh, you know, like the Elijah, uh, you know, feeding of the, you know, of, of the, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. I mean, this is just taking the fundamental Jewish religion that was helping promote rebellion and moving it into one, you know, that can ascribe uh, to existence in the Roman Empire. Um, so... You know, the um, you have to kind of go point by point to really sort of break this down clearly. But just in general, I I don't think there's any trouble at all between my theory and and uh, the uh, sort of the the influence of other religions. In fact, I would say that's sort of part and parcel of what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, you you've brought it up before, and and every time we have this conversation, it refreshes my memory on things that you've discussed and your book is written on. Something that just, if you don't mind me elaborating on this for a second, no. this is. Uh, this is one thing that is just amazing that I'm finding constantly with all other scholars, Elaine Pagels, uh, Steve Mason. Uh, I've even had Rabbi Tovia Singer come on not too long ago. Really wow, fascinating, yeah. great guest. Yeah. In fields. And they're all saying the same thing. They're all saying, Derek, there is this um, anti-Semitic darkness that you do see in the New Testament. And, and, and it's there. You can't get rid of it. And if we were to use the consensus scholarship on Paul and we go back and say the earliest ideas of Paul spouting, 
Paul's not very pro-Jewish, okay? And I'm not trying to say that he wasn't a Jew. Let's let's just go with the consensus and say the guy was a Jew. He was, he was potentially in the vein of these ideas. The thing is, he is stripping the identity. Uh, what we talked about before hitting uh, play, I was actually talking to a friend on the phone, and I think you caught the ass end of that conversation, where Paul's hijacking these, these identity markers of ancient Israel story, ancient Israelite religion. And now yeah. he's applying them to Joe Schmo and Athens and Corinth and, and Ephesus. And, and, and he's literally saying, we're taking this and I'm applying it to you. You guys are chosen. You guys are Israel. You guys are the people of God. And, and one of the things that gets me, I guess, in what you're saying here, there is kind of a syncretism, if you will, of, of thought in what Paul's doing in other religious movements as well as Judaism blending this stuff. But it, it does seem to fit when I read Second Temple uh, Judaism literature. There's always this, the Kittim or the Kittim, uh, the, the Gentiles, the ethne, they're always seen in a bad light. It, it, almost always, I'll say. You might find like the, um, the Sibylline oracles are pretty positive on Gentiles. It's rare that you find any document that's Jewish in nature that has a positive outlook on the ethne, the Gentile, the Goyim. And yet you get to the New Testament and it's loaded. I mean, that's like its center, its central thing is these guys are good. Thumbs up. Now, that's obviously, in my opinion, why it would be, I guess you say, why it still exists, why this is something I think that is promoted. If you took a ground up idea, which is the opposite of yours, and say that this somehow was an evolutionary idea within Judaism or some form on the ground, you could make this make sense, or it could be just as plausible that the political powers that be at the time are influencing people on the ground level and making this something proactive. So it's not either or, so to speak. It could be a both and. Uh, this discussion I had with Dr. Price and James Valiant on the similar pro-Roman aspects, and he said, you know, it could be that the Romans were involved in saying, Look, let's give these guys a hand. We like that philosophy. It's obvious we're not them. Let's use them like you talk about the Herodians. So, I, I look, a lot of this is speculative, and it's okay that it is, but we're doing a Socratic thinking here and going, okay, what's going on, and why is the New Testament? Why would a Gentile care? <laughs> right, right. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I would, uh, you know, like like Paul, for example, is a good person to put into the the lens of the Socratic process we're in right now. And I think if you look at that literature, his letters particularly, um, it, it becomes clear to me anyway that um, he's a fictional character, that the idea that Paul existed and is not, you know, being produced by the same a uh, literary group that produced the character of Jesus seems really far-fetched to me. Um, and and it's kind of a, sort of interesting to me, like how the idea of Paul's, you know, historicity is, is accepted, whereas many people, you know, like contest the, the idea of Jesus. You know, they talk about the myth of Jesus, but they also feel that Paul was real. I, I, this makes no sense to me. I mean, first of all, Really what someone needs to do to really kind of understand the Pauline literature or to, or to base in history is have an explanation for where the symbols come from. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of, like, Paul talks about Jesus being our Passover. And he has, you know, like a, descriptions of the Last Supper where Jesus is offering himself. Now, the, the, the human Passover lamb is a post-war concept. Now, this has to be the case. You can, you can, there is, well, first of all, it's a blaspheme. There is no basis in history for Paul having this, this concept if he doesn't get it from the information, you know, that is given out in, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels. The, um, the human Passover lamb, uh, you know, if you read Caesar of Messiah, you'll see that this is the central concept of the Gospels. You know, that's the new covenant. Um, you start out with a uh, with a Passover lamb, as you do in the original covenant. Uh, Jesus is crucified in Passover 33, 
you have a 40 year cycle. Uh, and then 40 years to the day, you have the conclusion of the Roman Jewish War, uh, Passover 73. Now, I'm sorry, but this just cannot be circumstance. So therefore, you can see the the writing of the Gospels is a post. Some people talk about, you know, like, well, maybe Mark could have been written, you know, in 68 or 66. I mean, this is preposterous. They They just aren't. Uh, they have no explanation for where the concepts come from. You you can't really generate the human Passover lamb before the war because the covenant uh, is a 40-year cycle precisely aligned with the conclusion of the Roman war. Interesting. Um, and yeah. so this is this is this is the the where that concept comes from. And central to that concept is uh, Josephus's um, uh, cannibal Mary passage. Very, it's very much related to what is the uh, basis for the human Passover lamb in the Gospels, you know, how they were actually able to create the concept. Paul has no explanation for it. He just uses the concept. Um, but um, uh, if um, uh, you, you really want to, you, when, you, when you analyze literature, you know, you really have to, like, have some sort of how they're, how they're generated. And in the case of the human Passover lamb, it's just very, very clear cut. It is, it is generated from the war. It's back calculated, the 40 year cycle. And now going forward in Acts, you actually have um, uh, clarification of this because they have the repeat of the Pentecost, right? So the author of Acts who's familiar with Paul certainly has an understanding of this cycle of a new cycle of the new covenant, right? right. And therefore, the, this author is linking precisely into the artificial 40-year cycle that was created post-war. This is so, actually why Dr. Price said the first coming, he, he pretty much is making a similar point of why yeah. the first coming wasn't official. Whether there was a character somewhere in the 30s that's like a white sheet of paper that can be yeah. drawn upon, he said, is irrelevant. The point he's making is this construct, uh, using the synoptic gospel approach, for example, clearly implying the temple's destruction, the circling, the raising of the temple, etc. All of that is clearly 70 to 73, what you're talking about here. Yeah. That they inserted a 40-year or a generation character just a generation back. From it's like 9-11, me and you witnessed what happened here. Let's go 40 years prior to that. Say this character in 1970, or you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and say, you know, that 40-year gap, so they inserted this character to fit the bill. But sure. I mean, Derek, there's no other way you could you can time the um the ministry of the uh, you know human Passover lamb except by back calculating it from the Roman war. It's impossible. And, and of course, then you have such such precision as to hit the 40 year cycle to the day. I mean, it's preposterous that, in fact, I would say that the 40 year cycle from, um, you know, 73 Passover to uh, 33 Passover is the clearest explanation that um, Rome produced the Gospels. And That's that what I was new- going to ask you, if you don't yeah. mind, and maybe yeah. you don't know off the top of your uh, mind. Where can we go to see that 73 Passover was actually the day where it ended? Well, you have um, you have uh, the you you there is the 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 reason why it's classically understood is the um, you can date um, the the first Passover. They have the uh, this the, there's a, a I'd have to go and actually look at it, but you'd have the, you have a timing of 16 years, which they because they have a particular date relative to Jesus's life, which then is able to date the beginning of the ministry to 30, and now you have three Passovers. So that's why if you go to Wikipedia, our our two you know early Christian kind of understanding of this, they would always say 33, 33 because of because of information generated. Uh, just obviously right out of the information given in the Gospels. Then with Josephus, 73, um, that's, that comes from Josephus himself, you know, as to it was about three years after the fall of, of, of Jerusalem that you had um, 
uh, the fall of Masada, which he dates to, to Passover. Now, that date is sometimes, you know, scholars say, well, you know, there's some reason to believe it was 72 or 74. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily agree, even though right. it is the direct reading of the text. But they, they misunderstand um, Josephus because Josephus gives you a very perfect way of dating the conclusion of the war in that he creates the abomination of desolation. He actually aligns the... Um, uh, the midpoint of the week, because remember, you're on the prophecies of Daniel are also, you know, coming to pass it in, inside uh, with Josephus. And Josephus just flat out says this. He right. says the prophecies of Daniel are coming to pass. We have the end of the daily sacrifice. This is what he talked about. Oh, my God, this is just terrible. Uh, Winston, who uh, was a Catholic or was a Christian and uh, was the, you know, did the the translator of, of uh, Josephus's work, which was so uh, influential for all these years. Um, he makes a huge deal about this. He goes, this just proves that Jesus was real, could see into the future, because look, the abomination of desolation is occurring exactly where it's supposed to be. It's about three and a half years from the start of the war, and it is therefore three and a half years to the conclusion of the week. You see, once, I mean, this, this is really like a, a very kind of mechanical way to understand how um, Rome, that Rome did produce the Gospels, is that you definitely have Joseph fictional, right? I mean, this couldn't be a real event. He, he, is, he is, at least the dating of it couldn't be real. He is dating the, um, the abomination of desolation to the midpoint of the week, which then gives you the conclusion as um, uh, Passover 33. It's rough approximation, but believe me, it's close enough uh, to, to not be circumstantial. And now you have the understanding of, um, uh, you know, kind of the, the conclusion of prophecy uh, being brought about uh, in, in Josephus' recording of the wars. But you also have a, a, a good way of understanding Paul, because you can't really have that concept, the human Passover lamb, accidentally um, in the in you know in, in Paul's literature, and then um, have it created later on in the Gospels. You know, it just so the you know, and then and then of course you know his name Tiny is uh, I think you know, if you look at how he's given the name, it's you know I think it's obvious Roman vulgar humor, and it's just there's so many things about Paul. I write about him in in uh, Shakespeare's Secret Messiah. I, that's actually the book that I go over Paul in the book of Revelation in. And so maybe after you read it, we could have a discussion about it. But um, I, I think that uh, getting back to you and Bob's discussion, I think you're just absolutely right that, you know, Paul is another um, illustration of the pro-Roman uh, and sort of strange transmorgification of Jewish theology uh, which which came uh, now, I think it can be at least uh, posited, came, comes out of, uh, you know, the Imperial Court of Rome. Interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, you, Joe, I don't I wish more people would at least give you uh, the time and day to consider what you're saying, even if they disagreed with you or thought maybe I'm not certain that he's right about it. Right. Like me, I'm very cautious. I don't know Josephus in depth. I have not studied these things, but what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Um, it does make a lot of sense. And this is why I'm trying to break those walls, those concrete walls uh, that are extremely uh, firm in, in how we're allowed to think and what we need to consider. Because, you know, what Paul's doing is so radically different. Placing him in the 40s and 50s is tough. Uh, I could see both sides and understand why people would think either way. But why not at least consider both sides? This is what I'm personally a fan of. Yeah, why I, don't we... I honestly don't understand why people would automatically think Paul is a historical individual. I think it's because the letters uh, seem sort of just, you know, kind of realistic. You know, he's tortured. He's struggling. It's, um, it doesn't seem like theology. Right. It, it seems, you know, but that isn't a perspective that would really be very difficult to construct, would it? Uh, you know, in fact, it's I mean, I think the Roman literary team could have no trouble coming up with this literature. I mean, basically, the 
you know, as I go into this in Shakespeare's Secret Messiah, but it's just there's different um, impulses of Roman, con, you know, inserting stuff into the Gospels. I mean, even Trajan, I think, ended up with like the Timothy, you know, uh, the, the like he he becomes like he puts himself in there. But certainly um, Dom Domitian does. And, and this is uh, what Paul represents. And just as, uh, you know, Titus comes up with Jesus and you have this whole revelation about the divinity of his military campaign, um, you know, Domitian has a Paul. And so then, you know, you have all these literary puzzles and things relating to Domitian's history. And it's just it's, it's complicated. It's far more complicated than the Gospels typology, which is so simple to follow. Right. But uh, but it is there and, and uh, it gives a good explanation for Paul. And you have finally a way of understanding where the concepts come from, because it isn't, you know, bear in mind, it's not just Paul's pro-Roman perspective, but his use of the of like the new covenant and um, and the human Passover land. I mean, he's very this is a major part of his work. And there's no explanation. If you, you know, there are like books like uh, Operation Messiah, mm -hmm. and they talk about Paul as being a Roman intelligent agent. But where where does he generate his symbols from? You know, I mean, it just does. There's no way you can plug the human Passover lamb into the history of pre pre Roman Jewish war. Human mm -hmm. Passover lamb is just absolutely cannot be. You know, there's no explanation for such a for such an idea. Whereas in the Gospels, it's so clear cut, you see. So, so state of coherency and parsimony, it's got to be that that the Pauline letters were post seventy. Interesting. You and Dr. Bob would share this similar idea on the post seventy AD yeah. uh, idea of Pauline literature, and um, obviously taking two different accounts of how you yeah. guys view yeah. it. You know, I wanted to give you something interesting. I think you'll yeah. uh, you'll appreciate this. And this is quite up the uh, alley of something that I'm sure he doesn't draw any of the conclusions you do in the same way. But I, I spoke to Dr. Bart Ehrman two days ago, did an interview with him again. We had a good donor who made that possible. Um, and he said he's working on writing a book about Revelation. And you know what he said? He said, Revelation is not a good book for Christians. He said uh, he's pretty much drawn, I think, some some pretty uh, dark conclusions about Christianity out of the book of Revelation. So I can't wait to see what he has to say, because <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if there's very similar conclusions on uh, in, in different ways? Of course, you guys will probably not. Yeah, come into, I mean, uh, that would be I, I, I would be curious as to how he approaches it. Um, right. um, you know, he. he He's uh, someone who comes out of academia and, um, I, you know, I don't want to be, I really don't like to trash talk uh, yeah. other scholars, but I, I just, his, his stuff doesn't make any sense to me. You know, the criteria of embarrassment, you know, as a way of uh, like, like supporting the historicity of Jesus is far fetched. And um, I, you know, I mean, I actually, I just think that, that the the guys that want to take the position that Jesus is historical, um, they of course have to overcome all of the typologic um, passages, which are not contested, right? Because obviously, you know, the miracle of loaves and fishes didn't occur because it's right. okay, and and obviously Jesus's pre ministry didn't occur because it's completely generated out of the you know the Moses stories, right? Right. And so then you start going, well, neither did the baptism. That didn't happen because if you look at uh, John the Baptist, he's obviously just, you know, representing Old Testament characters and stuff. And so you you end up with very little that could even be historical. You see, this is the thing is that there was some passages that they couldn't really link into the Old Testament. And so this was the basis, in fact, for the idea of Jesus being historical. But then when Caesar Messiah was brought out, and you could see that actually these passages had their origins in the Roman Jewish War, well, suddenly the whole character of Jesus was it just disappeared. There wasn't really any historical basis for them. And, you know, I, when, I remember I'm asked about, you know, like, uh, what, did Jesus exist? I mean, I always go, look, this is... This question is 
you know, cannot be answered. And it isn't really important, therefore. I mean, I hate to say this, but it isn't really that significant because you can't really ever, you know, the idea that, well, there was a Jesus, but he was embellished. Well, how could this be falsified? I mean, you know, embellishment is infinite. So there's no way to really falsify it. So there's no way to answer the question. It's not significant. The question is, is what is the literature that we have? That's the question. And here we, we can actually demonstrate that it's typological literature. There's no real history in this, in this story. There's, there's, a, there's all of these episodes that are made up of other stories that come from someplace else. And you see, this, this question as to what is the literature has an answer. It is typologic literature, tip to stern. And that is not a historical genre. I mean, you just when you write typology, you are not writing history. So that's the question that can be answered, and that's the one that the public, I think, really needs to, uh, you know, to, to come to an understanding about. Because I, I, I think that, oh, uh, you know, Christianity, um, uh, you know, the, the Christians deserve to have, as you say, you know, uh, like the whole story, and make up their their own mind about these things. But you know, they they really do need to focus on the nature of what we have, the, the, the story. Where do they come from? And once I think that the people can understand this typologic literature, then the question about whether or not the character it was historical it becomes uh, unimportant. Joe, you always uh, inspire me to want to <clears throat> look deeper, look harder. Um, I have my own opinions as we speak, but nothing's in concrete. You know, I'm not a, a mason, right? So uh, I don't use concrete in my buckets, if that makes sense. Uh, I do that on purpose because you know how hard it would be to take a jackhammer to your own ankles to get the concrete off your feet. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't draw serious, staunch conclusions. Um, I'm taking in what you're saying. It makes me want to go do some research. I got to reread Caesar's Messiah. Um, and what we might end up having to do, because you owe oh, every time I read it, I've read it three times already. Uh, every time I read it, I feel like I got to do another episode with you because there's something we didn't freaking talk about. Yeah, I know. There's, <laughs> you know, it's like, this is not my, uh, I'm not being like, you know, like either a really good writer, or a really terrible writer. It's the Romans. I mean, the people who constructed the gospels were really amazing. Um, kind of wordsmiths. They had a tremendous talent for literature and they worked really hard on it. And so when you start getting into it as Roman typology, there's just so many levels of it that start popping up that are, you know, you wonder, well, how deep does it all go? You know, they're, they're wordsmith and, and their desire to create very deep kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, they wanted to, I think, outdo the sort of mystery structure of the Jewish uh, literature. And so there's just there really is a lot inside the Gospels, which I don't write about in Caesar Messiah. In Caesar Messiah, honestly, what I tried to do was just to um, partition the simplest parts of what I was trying to say and just get that out there. That's why in, in like the uh, in the second edition, I brought out the Flavian signature, which which just takes Luke and Josephus because there, Luke has more parallels than either Mark or Matthew. Right. And so I don't switch or jump between, um, uh, you know, like going from Mark to, to, to Matthew and then trying to show, well, here, here's how the chronology worked. I just roll out the two texts. I just roll out, here's Josephus, here's, uh, here, here's uh, the Gospels, here you go. And, and then readers can just come to their own conclusion about whether or not there's dependency. Um, to, in my mind, it's just self-evident. The, the, the story of Jesus, the sequence, the locations, you know, this is just coming right out of uh, the Jewish war. Ladies and gentlemen, you gotta, you gotta give Joe a round of applause, get the book. Um, it's on audible as well. If you can't read it on paperback, I've got the paperback as well as audio. You can listen to it while you're vacuuming, while you're cleaning, doing the grass, whatever you're doing, driving, it's a must read. I absolutely recommend anyone to go do it. This video will be released obviously early on my Patreon, which helps me, Myth Vision, keep bringing you fine content like this because I want to stimulate the thinking process for everyone who's watching to consider multiple angles and say, hey, can I rule that out? What makes more sense to me? I really loved what you said to here uh, today, Joe. And 
look, uh, like I said, I, I'm very cautious to draw serious conclusions, so I need to investigate further and continue to study on this topic. But you have made me want to open up the book again <laughs> and reread it because it just makes me want to reinvestigate, uh, especially when I have you know, people like Steve Mason who come from the academic world. He left uh, because of the, pol the politics of, uh, of uh, you know, the colleges and stuff that he worked for. But uh, he just didn't want to deal with the baggage. But he's a, he's an erudite scholar. He reads these languages. He understands them. And he recently said, we got to do a Luke Acts episode, how Luke Acts is using Josephus. So I'm thinking to myself, like light bulbs and you know neurons are firing my frontal liberal cortex saying ding 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 like joe's on to something here this isn't stupid uh, yeah, this yeah. isn't just some conspiracy that isn't valid like there's something here so whether you draw joe's conclusions completely it's worth investigating and i say that if you're a consensus kind of person watching this video right now Go check it out. Wait till you see Steve Mason. If you have to listen to a consensus scholar say that something's going on here, well, that might be enough and nudge you over the edge to yeah, say. I, I've always yeah. wanted, if you can arrange a discussion between Steve and myself, I'd appreciate it. I've always liked his work and I'm curious as to what he would make of, uh, uh, just like, just, because I don't want to, I know he's busy. I would just like him to read the, uh, the Flavian signature chapter. Right. And, and see how that plugs into his work, because I have a feeling he'd be quite surprised uh, uh, at the sequence, how powerful sequence is in relationship between the two literatures. Wow. You you sparked an interesting idea in my head. And you know me. I'm, I've got that silver. I know. Stuff. You, you are someone who actually gets things done, for heaven's sakes. You know, it's wonderful. And tonight, Thank you. I just wanted to I didn't want to, like, you know, not mention uh, the gratitude that everyone who is interested in in for you, you know, and, and I mean, what you've done is really remarkable. Your channel is really um, just broadening up New Testament scholarship wonderfully. And I think it's, you're really improving um, an important genre, but a really ossified giant like structure. It's just amazing Thank you. to me to see how, when you get all of the, your scholars, you know, in a sequence and then have relationships, that you really start to, to make improvements in, in the scholarship in general. Um, hats off to you, buddy. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Don't make my head grow any bigger. It won't fit in the screen. You won't be able to. <laughs> hey, it should. In fact, I was thinking we should try to, you know, make kind of maybe deify you. It's, uh, you know, like this would be the Roman, you know, like we'd have to go through the Senate to get a proclamation, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. No, you know my wife here and that she's gonna go. Oh, yeah, okay, well, let's, let's let's hold off on that. You better stop right now. You know, <laughs> no. Um, seriously, Joe, I, I appreciate you, your friendship, your scholarship, the ideas that you present. Um, I'm not, you know, one of these guys who's, uh, you know, you can't listen to this guy unless he has a, a MD or a, a BA or a Masters or a PhD. No, I interview many ideas, and you're very very intelligent in the way you approach this. Uh, Eisenman, you know, tag teamed with you a long time. And I, I love Eisenman. Trust me, I need to read his book, by the way. It's a large book. A lot of people said I need to read. But I have to say, in, in the later years of his life, I tried interviewing him, and it's very, very difficult um, to, yeah. to – but I, I, people are like, your patience was wonderful. I'm glad that you're able to stick through it. Um, but Eisenman's just Eisenman. He is a, he's a, a maverick and it's tough to, to, to pierce the armor on, on him. And it takes someone like psychologically to maneuver while you're interviewing him to try and like, uh, allow him to get the best out of him. Uh, but he's up there in age and I wish his mind yeah. was still the same. It was 20 years ago. We all get old buddy. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, that's why you want to get these. That's why you, you really need to work quick if you're going to like, I know. Um, you know, get get all of the these ideas. But you know, it, it's a it's a process. Christianity has been around and has been so powerful. The ideas, you know, of this coming from history and not as a fictional literature, uh, have had just such power. You know, like for the last two thousand years, really good to open it up and and. Uh, I, I honestly think if if uh, Miss Vision um, 
just grows like you know in a steady rate you'll you'll start to actually have some changes in uh, in how the scholarship functions which will be great you know before it'll be more uh, socratic as you said it'll be more open to different ideas i think it's necessary and i think that eventually colleges will start to realize that the medium the real medium is this is this yeah. platform is the online platform because the in person going and having a lecture by us i'm not downplaying that okay that's all necessary and important part of the process and stuff that's great i'm just saying i think they're going to find out what's really going to take over is this online medium in a different way. It's, it's, yeah, it's so boring. I mean, you've been to these New Testament classes. They're just, you know, because they, they uh, in, a, in an hour where you've got an entire course, they tend to focus on microscopic things. And um, the, the real way to do this for the public is to have the, you know, all of the scholars have an opportunity, but don't give them any more than an hour at a time so that they will give out their best ideas, their most coherent ideas. The idea is that the the public can relate to, you know, mm -hmm. um, I just think your interviews are, are fascinating. You know, I mean, they are really interesting and that's why, you, you know, you're getting such popularity, but it's, it's, um, uh, you know, there is obviously highly technical aspects, you know, of, of the, of the gospels, you know, the new Testament. Um, but there's also, there should be synopsis. There should be like generalities. There should be some kind of wisdom and interesting things that come out of the, the research that then, they can reach out to the public with because the public isn't going to go into like three years of training in Greek to be able to like get into the battle between, you know, Mason and, and some other Josephan scholar, because it's just too technical. If, if their ideas are valid, they can be generalized. They can be put out in a way that the public can get interest in them and connect to them and get value out of them. You know? So this is what I think is really going on with myth vision is you're, you're, reaching, you're trying to get New Testament scholarship into the public world, where it has value there, where it isn't just some kind of little academic thief arguments over things which are really of very little importance, frankly. The broad stroke, this is a broad stroke religion. We need broad stroke discussions from the experts, you know, and this is what you're doing. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, one of the goals is to let the audience live vicariously through my thinking process as well. <laughs> we do, we do. Yeah, we that's do the goal sure. is to like, like I want you to think like, what's Derek thinking? And did you see Derek's yeah. facial expressions there? Yeah, he that's a little right. bit more confident. Well, or? you know, I, I just think, you know, you're just bringing out the best ideas, the most interesting ideas, the ideas that connect to the public more than the technical stuff. The technical stuff has to be there, obviously, right. to support it all, but... Um, at some point, you want to have something that's communicable to the public. Yeah, you know, I, I, I get an argument. You know, it's like one of the like you get the sense that the academics have at the back the idea that they will become public intellectuals. You know that they're going to end up because of their scholarship having some stature in the public, which hopefully will give them some like money, right? Right. But. Um, Okay, that's fine. But if, if you want that, that should not, you know, but to do that, you have to come up with some ideas which can connect to the, to the public. You have to have a synopsis, um, a, you know, something that is actually understandable. Um, and it just seems so often that, that they are confused by the fact that their technical uh, understanding and, and contest that they're having over the Greek particles isn't making them a public intellectual. You know, um, Bart Erdman actually does a pretty good job of, of uh, you know, kind of coming up with ideas that uh, the public at least finds interesting. Right. And I, I think, um, you know, he doesn't, re he rarely debates. I, I, he, he uh, when, when Caesar Messiah started getting popular, he came out with a statement that even like his students would win a debate with me. And I got a hold of him and I said, gee, that's a great, idea, why don't we have a discussion, Bart? Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, if you want to get a discussion with Bart, it costs a lot of money. So <laughs> it didn't happen. But anyway, um, I, I just think that that was an example of, of what is great about myth vision is that you provide, it's like, look, you, you really have this, you know, like, you know, kind of reasoning that, that someone's approach is incorrect. Look, you can have it there now is a venue. You don't have to go through renting a hall 
getting, you know, like assignments from the university, you know, for the time off and things like that. You can get, hey, you want to talk? Let's get up. Let's let's have this discussion. So this is people that are watching this stuff. Yeah. To actually see it. It's yeah. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um, I I made this prediction. You will. This is this is true. I actually did this. I said you were going to be like, remember, I said this like over a year ago. I said, I think your your approach is correct. And I think you're going to be the most popular thing in New Testament scholarship within a few years. And you know what? I'm sticking with my prediction. I think you're about a year out and, uh, you know, because this is just the right approach and no one else is doing it. So I was going to ask you if you were interested in being adopted into the family and me call you Joe Atwell Lambert uh, and you uh, take uh, on my last name because well, yeah. these prophecies, uh, Mr. Joseph, uh, the dreamer, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I did, I, I, you got to admit, Derek, I did actually. Have you a- really yeah. did on the phone. People don't even know this. I walk in at my mother-in-law's in the backyard talking to Joe and he's like, Derek, I'm telling you, man, I, I'm telling you keep it up with this show you're gonna yeah, see yeah. and i'm thinking to myself well since i'm now the emperor yeah. it's very important that i look out for my pro- my prophetic uh, uh yeah, you know but the thing is i knew i really knew new testament scholars well because i'd had like exchanges with so many of them you know i mean yeah. he, 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 i was sort of the guilty pleasure of a lot of people who didn't they would go well i can have a communication with you but you can't ever let anyone know that i'm talking to you this would happen all the time you know so i i knew kind of knew them pretty well but i also knew the public appetite yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. that, that that I really, you know, because I'd seen this. And so I said, you know, there's really no one else that could do this for a number of reasons. And so anyway, I, I you know, I, we, we can we can't go on too far in praising you. Nope, because of the No, military. don't please. But, but, I, but I knew I knew that this was the right approach. This is what the public wanted. And this is what the scholars needed. Yeah, They needed this. So anyway, it's it was uh, you got both sides now to you know, to be in a, in a better, in a better system. And it's, it's going to, it's just going to grow and grow. Well, let's just keep growing it and make the connections happen. Don't forget to get uh, Joe Atwell's book, Caesar's Messiah, Flavian edition. Of course, I'm going to talk to Steve Mason, Dr. Steve Mason, my good friend. See yeah. if we can't set up that discussion. Joe, thank it you. So a lot much. of fun. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it, buddy. Absolutely. And ladies okay. and gentlemen, do not forget. We are myth vision. Mm-hmm.